start out by having you explain who you are, a little bit about your background, and what you are doing these days. Sure. So my name is Joe Dispenza. Uh, I've written four books. Uh, my first book was called Evolve Your Brain, The Science of Changing Your Mind. <clears throat> then I wrote another book called Breaking the Habit of Being Yourself, How to Lose Your Mind and Create a New One. And that book uh, kind of caused me to head more to a practical approach. In other words, the science behind what uh, is now kind of mainstream uh, more than 15 years ago was a was a whole different world of consciousness. So I, I wanted to start bridging just the philosophical component to more of the practical uh, applying. Uh, then I wrote another book called uh, You Are the Placebo, uh, Making Your Mind Matter. And, and in that book, I wanted to demystify the process of teaching people the same science of how the placebo works, but instead of relying on something outside of you in order to alter your internal state, can you do it by thought alone? And uh, then my last book uh, that I've written just a couple years ago uh, is called Becoming Supernatural, How Common People Are Doing the Uncommon. And in that book, uh, it was uh, my best attempt to explain what we do at our advanced workshops and provide people not only the science and the understanding, but giving them all the meditations and, and tools for them to begin to apply uh, to their life. And so I demystify many different things, but one of the things that I was the most excited about in that book was demystifying the transcendental experience, the mystical moment, and what it is, and what are the latent systems in the brain and body that connect the physics of the quantum field to the biology of our brain and body. And uh, uh, so that was my latest book. Um, I run events uh, around the world. Uh, and uh, again, we teach people uh, how to apply these uh, principles so that they can live a better life, to heal their body, uh, to heal from childhood scars and wounds, uh, to create new jobs, new relationships, new opportunities, and to have those mystical experiences that change them forever. And, and, uh, and I believe if you get enough people together in a, in a workshop setting, uh, there comes a moment where people start to break through and then it becomes like a brush fire. So um, we have witnessed some of the most amazing things that uh, has changed me uh, and changed my beliefs on a very deep level. So I have a team of researchers and scientists that I work with and our laboratory is our, is, is our workshops and um, We've done thousands and thousands and thousands of brain measurements, uh, quantitative studies of the brain, pre and post measurements. You know, someone comes, we measure their brain, we put them through a week of training or five days of training, and then we measure their brain at the end to see if there wasn't just changes in their mind, but there's changes in their brain. Uh, we've also measured uh, quantitative studies in the brain in real time, like what's happening in your inner world of thoughts and feelings, or what's happening in your brain when you're attempting to, to change some thought or change uh, 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 some aspect of yourself. And we've gained so much information about that process in, in, in creating a formula, a way to, uh, uh, to self-regulate in your inner world that begins to produce measurable effects of not only in your body but in your life. We've done thousands of studies on H HRV measurements to see if people can sustain or self-regulate more elevated emotions, what that does to their immune system, what that does to their uh, to their gene expression, what it does to their telomere lengths, determine your true biological age, what happens to energy, you know, the body is always emitting light and information. Uh, when a person truly begins to break through, do they begin to emit more of a frequency or is there more energy and information being released? And, and all of that is to give people uh, the, the opportunity to begin to understand that you don't have to be a Buddhist monk or uh, a, a nun with 40 years of devotion or an academic or a scholar that once you understand the formula and you begin to apply it on a regular basis, uh, you become a scientist in your own life and you get to see the changes, not only in your body but in your, in your outer world as well. So um, my passion and my interest <clears throat> is um, to prove to people how powerful they really are. It's amazing. And you're seeing that in your workshops, especially as you're measuring this yeah, I think that uh, I'm waking up in my dream, that if you said to me 10 years ago, you're going to witness what you're witnessing presently, I probably wouldn't have believed you, but um, we are witnessing some of the most amazing healings and transformations that are happening, and, and it's so important to understand this, because 15 years ago, it was all about 
the philosophy, the theory, the science, the knowledge, the intellectual data. And we're in an age of information, you know, and in an age of information, ignorance is a choice. You know, you don't need an authority to gain information now. You don't need a priest, you don't need a teacher, you don't need a doctor. You can gain information because of technology. And, and so what's happened now is that, is that information is so readily available that people want to understand how to use it. So I think this is a time in history where it's not enough to know. I think this is a time in history to know how. And so, uh, for me, giving people the opportunity, numerous opportunities to connect to that invisible field of energy and information, giving them numerous opportunities to get beyond themselves, uh, numerous opportunities to begin to practice changing their brainwaves so they can get into the operating system where all those hardwired attitudes and subconscious programs exist, and, and teaching them how to self-correct each time, sooner or later they're going to run into something great. And so what we've seen in the last uh, five years or so is that we've seen such significant changes in, in what's happened, what could possibly happen in a week, you know, from blind people seeing, deaf people hearing, uh, tumors disappearing before our eyes, of people with Parkinson's disease who came in with very, very serious symptoms, walking out uh, in, in a very changed state. And some of them are psychotherapists, some of them are medical doctors, some of them are just people that are very well educated that ran out of solutions and decided that maybe it was time for them to start doing some inner work. And so for me, I think something amazing has happened that we've pierced a veneer, a layer of consciousness, you know, just like the four minute mile, that it was just this barrier that nobody could ever cross. But once the first person uh, broke the four minute mile within a very short amount of time there was other people doing it so the belief changed and it became a, a consensus it became a new level of consciousness of what was possible right and so we're seeing these dramatic healings we're seeing uh, people's skill sets in in their ability to self-regulate as an example uh, we have a university in in uh, on the gold coast of australia a bond university that has taken good portion of our brain scans and just spent about nine months looking at all the different variables to, to analyze exactly what we're doing. And the first thing the researcher said was, we have never seen such a large group of people be able to change their brain waves in such a short amount of time. We're talking four seconds, five seconds, nine seconds. Now, what does that mean from a practical standpoint? Well. You have your conscious mind, and when you're in your conscious mind, you're functioning in a brainwave pattern called beta brainwave patterns. It's, it's, it's where your neocortex is thinking and reasoning and analyzing and, and, and integrating all the information with your outer world with, with, to connect with your inner world. And, and in order for you to begin to make substantial changes, you've got to lay that down. You've got to know how to suppress the thinking analytical mind. You have to know how to quiet down the circuits in the brain that are connected to your personality self. Uh, you got to get beyond the known aspect of your memory bank, the autobiographical self. And when you do, you start tapping into something greater. And so we have students that have that ability to do it in a very short amount of time, and our research shows that. At the same time, we have research to show that, wow, a mystical moment looks something like this. And we see it repeatedly every time. In fact, we now know that we can induce it. And the, re the fact that it's so consistent, anything that's uh, consistent or repeatable is science, right? Because you're looking at a trend, you're looking at a law. So we're seeing evidence in our scans and in our scientific research that's saying something amazing has happened, you know, something powerful is happening to a person. And then we have people standing up in the audience and saying, Hey, I had stage four cancer, I had endometriosis, I had serious tinnitus and vertigo, I went to 10 different doctors, no change. Uh, I was allergic to everything, I had to wear a mask, I'd go into anaphylactic shock uh, every single day. I had 50 brain tumors, now I don't have any. And you know, they stand in front of an audience and they tell their story. And the story isn't always glamorous and it isn't always a Hollywood version of a triumph. A lot of times they've lost family members, they've lost their job, they went bankrupt. You know, there's a rough road when you're recovering from a disease. Uh, but they never gave up. They never stopped believing in possibility. And I think when you believe in possibility, you believe in yourself. 
When you believe in yourself, you believe in possibility. So they stand in front of an audience, and I stand on a stage, and I'm looking out at the audience, and I'm watching 1,500 people with tears rolling down their face because the evidence of this person and the story and their humility and their simplicity and the way that uh, they're not using their own accomplishment to, to, um, to endorse their ego. In fact, they've worked so hard at overcoming their ego every single day that they figured out they wouldn't build it up the next day because they'd have to face it again the next day. So they've, they've made great strides in, in getting better at connecting. They've made great strides of understanding that they could signal new genes because they saw the evidence, right? So they tell their story and everybody in the audience is leaning in. And they're moved and the person doesn't look like a rock star, doesn't look young, doesn't look buffed, doesn't look like a vegetarian, they just look like a normal person. <laughs> And they're not, they're, they're just, they, they're, they're a common person. And that's so important because it allows people to associate and identify with, oh, well, that isn't Jane on the television commercial who's in her 60s and looks fit and slim and she's got this disease and well, if she's got it or I'm not, don't look anything like her or I'm going to get it. Uh, it's, it's just that you start really starting to see some uh, veils being removed. And when they tell their story and they finish their story, uh, people are so moved that they understand that it's possible for them. So the side effect of that is you assign more meaning, more intention behind what you're doing. And when you do, you're investing a stronger energy or a stronger intention to an outcome. So now you have evidence in the science that says you don't have to be anybody special. The brain scans are there, the, the genetic tests are there, the immune tests are there, telomere tests are there, and then you have this incredible community of people giving testimonials. And those testimonials are, you know, people with strokes that were paralyzed, you know, for two years, that, that's a doctor of law who had no belief that he was ever going to heal, who now is lifting his arm above his shoulder wow. in a week-long event, and you watch this, or a blind person who was blind since she was at, at birth, uh, you know, three months old, who's now seeing for the first time faces and, and not just shadows and outlines. I mean, she had 5% vision. It's going to change you on a very gut level because you're witnessing miracles that are of biblical proportion, right? And, and you're, you're, you're in the presence of this. So now you have evidence with people telling stories, and stories are such powerful teaching tools. Allegory is an amazing way that people can associate, and that's what was used in folklore and tradition. So when you have evidence here, scientifically, then you have evidence where people send their brain scans in, send their eye scans in, send their blood tests in, and we have this large body of real powerful transformation. You have a footprint in consciousness, that's being left for other people to step in or footprints in consciousness to step in. Why? Because when a person stands on the stage who has stage four cancer or a rare genetic disorder that medical science has no solution for, and there just happens to be a person in the audience with the same rare genetic disorder, you, you, you see that person latch on to the understanding and instead of taking them two years to reach that pinnacle moment where they heal, they do it in three months. Why? They stepped into the same footprint in consciousness and it got them there faster. So then by the same means, <laughs> you have evidence before you and the evidence is causing information to be exchanged in three-dimensional reality that is so important because you need, you need one foot in the real world and one foot in the quantum world to begin to say, okay, something is happening here that's really powerful. Something is happening here that's really transformational. And it's a movement. And the movement is saying that we have been conditioned and hypnotized into believing that we're limited. And the real work is overcoming those limitations. And the overcoming process is the key element. Because as you overcome some aspect of yourself, overcome another aspect of yourself, overcome another aspect of yourself, you're going to start becoming somebody else. And when you truly become that person, 
There's no need to visualize a disease going away. You're not the same person. The disease exists in the old person. You're somebody else. And we have so many great stories to prove that that evidence is exactly the truth. And evidence is the loudest voice right now. And there is a lot of evidence at these workshops and, and what you've gathered, um, which again, like you said, just strengthens someone's belief in possibility. So explain to us what is going on, what, the majority of us, when we're normal or natural, mm -hmm. you know, between the difference between being becoming supernatural. Um, you know, we t you talk about we're addicted to our emotions that are keeping us in the past, mm -hmm. but we need to, like one foot in the quantum world, we need to be actively co-creating the future that we want. Mm -hmm. Can you explain the difference between where most people live and where you get people to to live? So we live in the material world, right? The three-dimensional reality. And it's called three-dimensional reality because everything occupies space and time. So whether you're looking at a chair or a table or a person, we could say that person is local in space and time. And the way that we interact with three-dimensional reality is through our senses. In fact, our senses plug us into the three-dimensional reality. So if you take away uh, your senses. If you couldn't see, you couldn't hear, you couldn't smell, you couldn't taste, you couldn't feel, you would have no experience of this three-dimensional reality. Now, in this three-dimensional reality that you and I are conscious of existing in, there's an infinite amount of space. Space is eternal. And we experience time when we move through space. So let's just say I'm one point of consciousness, Joe Dispenza, and you're another point of consciousness. I'm aware of myself and I'm aware of you. That's my second point of consciousness. There's space between us. Now, if I was gonna move closer to you, I'd have to move through space or collapse space. And when I do, I experience time. So time is a function of moving through space, right? one point of consciousness to another point of consciousness. By the same means, there's me here and then the bathroom somewhere. And if I have the thought of the bathroom, I become conscious of another local point in space and time. And if I'm gonna move my body to the bathroom, then I'm gonna hold the image of, my, of the bathroom and my body is going to move through space and it's gonna take me a certain amount of time to get there. So everything in this three-dimensional reality usually takes time to create. In fact, there's me here and then there's my dreams and where do I place my dreams? Way over there. My brain naturally creates my dreams separate from me, right? So my experience of linear time says, time is gonna look a lot like the past and when I project how long it's gonna take, my brain's gonna naturally come up with how far in the future it's gonna be. Mm. And we do that unconsciously. So because everything is local in space and time, then we experience separation from everyone and everything. Now, if you look a little differently than me, if you uh, are acting a little different than me, then I experience more separation, right? Because I can't predict who you're gonna be. So separation then is the fundamental understanding of three-dimensional reality and in fact lack is the side effect of separation so you you're driving down the road and you see somebody with a new car you're in a shopping mall and you see someone with a really nice wardrobe the moment you notice something really beautiful or notice something that you like you experience the fact that you don't have it so you experience this separation or lack and so the brain naturally goes about the business of dreaming the next moment the brain is wired to dream, all of a sudden you see yourself driving the car. You see yourself wearing the wardrobe, and in fact, you're actually living in that future reality in the present moment. And so, the passionate person who does this, the thought that they're thinking in their mind of driving the car or the, wearing the new wardrobe actually becomes the experience, and the end product of an experience is called an emotion. So then you start feeling like you're in that future and your body is the unconscious mind does not know the difference between the experience that's creating the emotion and the emotion that you're fabricating by thought alone. The body's actually believing in that moment that it's living in the future reality in the present moment. And we could say then the body's getting a sampling emotionally of the future. And the stronger the emotion that you feel from that inner event, the more altered you feel inside of you, the more you pay attention to what's causing it, and it's the thought in your brain. And we could say then that's how conditioning starts. It only takes an image or a thought and an emotion. And if you keep doing the image and the thought and the emotion, you start conditioning your body to begin to live more in the future than in the past. 
So then why is that important? Because if you get up and you feel like you own that car and you feel like uh, you're beautiful and wearing this wardrobe, as long as you feel that feeling, you're not going to be looked in the thought and the emotion because you feel like it's already happened. You're no longer in lack. But when you come back to your senses and your senses says, where's the car? Where's the wardrobe? The person goes back into separation and lack. So what do they do? They try harder. They try to predict. They try to control. They fight for it. They force, manipulate. Uh, they compete. They do whatever they can to get what they want because in this three-dimensional reality, they're believing their matter, trying to change matter. And when we do, we only have a certain amount of skills to get what we want. Now, throw in the hormones of stress, and living in stress is living in survival. And stress is when your brain and body are knocked out of homeostasis. The stress response is what your brain and body innately do to return itself back to order. And all organisms in nature can tolerate short-term stress. A, a deer gets chased by a pack of coyotes. The moment the deer outruns the coyotes, it goes back to grazing, returns back to balance and homeostasis. But during that event, when the deer is perceiving danger or a threat, the moment that happens and it starts switches on that sympathetic nervous system, now there's an arousal. And as you know, mobilizing all this energy for some threat in the outer environment, the important point is, is that the arousal of those chemicals heighten the senses. And, and it causes us to become materialists. In other words, under the gun of the fight or flight nervous system in survival, it's not a time to create. It's not a time to open your heart. It's not a time to learn. It's not a time to communicate. It's not a time to sit still and do a meditation. <laughs> and it's certainly not a time to be vulnerable. It's a time to run, fight, and hide. And the physiology of that response, mobilizing enormous amounts of energy, changes the body's physiology into emergency mode. So then, when we're in that state and we're altered, we narrow our focus on the material world because our senses are heightened and the arousal of those chemicals is causing us to pay attention to something material. We become very narrow focus or object focus. Now, for the short term, that's really great, but most people become habituated. And now, they're only looking at the particle in quantum physics and they're not seeing any other possibilities. In fact, if you're living in the state, which for the most part is about 70% of the time for most people, and living in survival for that extended period of time, once, was, once, was, once what was very adaptive becomes very maladaptive. Because when you turn on that stress response and you can't turn it off, you know you're headed for some disease. There's no energy in your inner environment for growth and repair if all of the energy is being mobilized for some threat in your outer environment. So the arousal of those chemicals is like a, a triple cappuccino. You get a rush of energy. Uh, and people tend to associate that rush of energy with feeling something, right? So they start using the problems and conditions in their life uh, to reaffirm the need for that rush of energy. So in a sense, they become addicted to the life they don't even like, right? And this is like why change is so hard because an addiction is something that you think you can't stop. So uh, people become very dependent on the stimulation from their outer world to make them feel something in their inner world. So why is that important? Well, because if it's not Tyrannosaurus Rex hanging outside the cave, but it's your coworker in the cubicle next to you, well, and you're living in judgment or resentment or fear or anxiety or anger or, fr or frustration or impatience, it's those chemicals that are really having the most dramatic effect on nobody else but you. So then, if you can think about your problems and turn on the stress response by thought alone, well, then you can become addicted to your own thoughts. And if it's a fact that genes get downregulated because of the hormones of stress and you can turn on that response by thought alone, your thoughts are obviously going to make you sick. And so when people begin to realize that it was the mismanagement of their attention and energy, uh, they start making better choices. So, so then, the rush of adrenaline and cortisol, your body gets aroused so you have more attention on your body. The arousal of those chemicals drives your brain into very, very high states of what's called high beta brainwave patterns. And when you're in that high beta state and you're aroused, 
and you're feeling like you can't predict an outcome, you have the perception that something's going to get worse, uh, you can't control something, this is what exactly turns on the stress response. So now when you're in that state and you have the arousal of those chemicals, the first thing you do is you start trying to control everything. So you shift your attention from one person to another person to another person to another thing to another problem to another meeting to another place to your cell phone to your computer to the laundry and every one of those elements has a neurological network in your brain. Your brain is mapped to everything that's known in your life. So as you begin to shift your attention from one to the next, if you were to measure the brain when we do that, it's like a lightning stored in the clouds. I mean, there's very, very significant dysregulation or incoherence that's happening in the brain. And that high beta brainwave state causes us to get over-focused and overly analytical and overly critical of ourselves and everything around us. So <laughs> then that it makes total sense then that if you're analyzing yourself within some disturbing emotion, you're gonna make your brain worse. We've seen it thousands of times. In fact, not only will it make your brain worse, but it'll drive it further more into those higher aroused states. And, and that, that state then causes you to not wanna go within. Like, you gotta keep your eye on your body, your environment, and you better be thinking about how long this is gonna go. How long am I gonna live in this discomfort? So then, the three-dimensional reality is really just about your body in an environment in linear time. So the hormones of stress cause us then to be become very local in space and time. And when you turn on that response, you're drawing from this invisible field of energy, of light and information that's surrounding your body, this vital life force, and you're turning it into chemistry. And when you do that, the field around your body shrinks a little bit. Mm. You become more matter, less energy, more particle, less wave, and now, you start trying as matter, trying to change matter to force outcomes. Do that for an extended period of time, then you don't have any energy to heal. You don't have any energy to create a new future. You, you've, you've actually tapped your body's life force, its reserves. So then, what's the solution? Well, what have we found? That a part of the formula is shifting from what we call a convergent focus, a narrow focus on something material, to begin to broaden your focus, close your eyes, and instead of narrow your focus, open your focus or broaden your focus, or what's called a divergent focus is opening your focus out, convergent focus, focusing in. So as you begin to open your focus, uh, you start going against that habit. And people do it for a few seconds and then they go back to the habit, but if you keep teaching them how to do that, uh, and they keep opening their awareness to space, to nothing material, the act of sensing and tuning in to frequency causes them to stop analyzing and thinking. When you're sensing, you're not analyzing, you're sensing, you're feeling. And when you do that, if you're thinking less, you start slowing down your brain waves and you stop kicking that analytical mind into gear. So the whole purpose of meditation is to get beyond the analytical mind. And what separates the conscious mind from the subconscious mind is the analytical mind. And if you can't change your brain waves and get beyond that analytical mind, you're separate from the operating system where all those subconscious programs exist. So then, as you begin to open your awareness and you're thinking less, as you shift your brain waves from beta, as it slows down, you start moving into what's called alpha brainwave patterns. And now, your inner world tends to be more real than your outer world, and you're not thinking as much, and there's no critic in your head, no voice in your head talking to you. Instead, your brain is creating in pictures and images, and it's slowing down. But not only does it move into alpha, our research shows that all of a sudden, the brain starts to synchronize. As you slow your brain waves down and you're sensing space, different compartments of the brain that were subdivided, that were incoherent, start to synchronize. And what sinks in the brain starts to link in the brain. And you see the brain start functioning in a more holistic state. Now when the brain is coherent, it, the more orderly and more coherent it gets, the more energy that happen, uh, happens to take place in the brain. So when we talk about students having the ability to do this in four seconds, five seconds, nine seconds, we're talking about them like taking a, a magic pill that takes their brain from a very disorderly state in a matter of seconds and becoming highly orderly. So then what is the reason behind that? Well, from a theoretical standpoint, 
how much of people's attention is on matter during the day and how much of people's attention is on energy. So most people have all of their attention on matter because that's what they believe reality to be and they have no experience of energy and information. So then when you begin to open your focus and you begin to open your awareness and your brain waves begin to slow down, something really magical happens. You take your attention off your body and when you do, you go from a somebody to a nobody. You take your attention off the people in your life that you identify with that's become your identity and you go from someone to no one. You take your attention off the things you own, your cell phone, your computer, your house, and you go from something to nothing. You take your attention off where you sleep, where you work, uh, where you're sitting, and you go from somewhere to nowhere. And if you're not thinking about the predictable future or the familiar past, you go from some time to no time. And that is the sweet spot of the generous present moment. And now you're beginning to abandon your association of everything known in this material three-dimensional reality. And in a sense, you're moving into that present moment as pure consciousness. Now you are on the bridge to the quantum field. And when you're tuning into energy and frequency, the signature of the unified field, the quantum field, it's an invisible field of orderliness and energy that connects everything physical. So then as you start swimming upstream and start connecting to this energy, you'll experience greater degrees of oneness and wholeness and less separation from everyone and everything. And this is what we call getting beyond the self. So the brain, the two hemispheres of the brain start synchronizing. And you can see the front of the brain talking to the back of the brain, the right side of the brain talking to the left side of the brain. And when researchers come and study our work, we always say, oh, watch this. She's going to pop in a second. What do you mean? Just, just watch. This is going to be beautiful. And then when you see those two hemispheres come together, the union of polarity, the union of duality, the union of opposites is wholeness. And those two hemispheres are synchronizing and the person has this huge smile on their face. And now they're feeling like it's already happened. In fact, they feel so whole. It's impossible for them to want. How could you want when you feel whole? There's no lack and no separation. And now you're moving closer to that unified field as pure consciousness. You can't take your body, you can't take the people in your life, you can't take your problems, you can't take your disease. You gotta get beyond yourself and enter naked as pure consciousness. Now, the unified field, that information that's in the field, you can become conscious of because it's chock full of frequencies, orderly frequencies, and all frequencies carry information. But you can't experience it with your senses because that's the realm of three-dimensional reality. So that's another belief or habit you have to break down. And yet when you move into this elegant moment, something really profound happens. When you become nobody, no one, no thing, nowhere, and no time, reason this with me. If we took away everything material in this three-dimensional reality, all the bodies in the world, all the people in the world, all the objects, all the things, all the places. We took away the planets, the moons from those planets, the stars, the light from the stars, the galaxies, uh, the meteors, uh, everything in this known material universe. If we took away everything physical, we'd be left with an empty black space where there's nothing physical. But just because you can't see something doesn't mean it doesn't exist that that place is where there's non-locality, possibility. It hasn't manifested into three-dimensional reality. So this is the eye of the needle that we have to pass through. Now, at the exact same time the heart starts getting highly organized, something amazing happens because when you're living in the fight or flight realm and you can't run, you can't fight, and you can't hide or freeze because you're in a job or you're sitting at a business meeting or you're at a dinner table or whatever and the heart is pumping really hard because it's believing that there's a predator behind it but there's no predator and you're stepping on the gas and you're stepping on the brake at the same time and the heart is trying to race but you're holding the brake mm. the heart starts beating very incoherently and energy moves out of this creative center this is our creative center. This is our connection to the unified field. This is the center of oneness and wholeness. This is where our divinity begins, right here. So then when the heart is beating like that and you're stepping on the gas and the brake, it's beating very incoherently. 
And that's when you stop trusting yourself. That's when you stop knowing. That's when you stop feeling grateful. That's when you stop feeling loving or enjoying your life. And now the, the arousal of those chemicals causes you to function in two hemispheres in duality. Then it makes sense then if you're in duality or in polarity, when you're analyzing and you're thinking, you, can, you lose your joy. And so the very chemicals are arousing the analytical minds. And so then you're loving life and all of a sudden you start analyzing, you lose it, right? Mm -hmm. So when the heart though begins to respond to this kind of orderliness where the two hemispheres are coming together, it start, energy starts to move right into the center. We've, we've measured it. And when it moves into the center, once it makes it here, it's only going one way. And that's straight up into the brain. So now here comes this opening of the heart, the person's starting to feel more whole, they're feeling it not, not from a theoretical standpoint, they're feeling it biologically and physiologically. And once energy makes it to this center and it begins to amplify energy into the brain, now you start operating from a different level of consciousness. You start thinking differently. This, this energy, this emotion is driving a whole new set of thoughts. You're not, you're not angry, you're not impatient, you're not resentful, you're not frustrated. In fact, you're loving everybody, you're loving life. There's a whole different set of thoughts in the brain that begins to switch on. By the same means, once energy makes it to your heart and it starts getting coherent, and we've measured this, it begins to produce a measurable magnetic field that can be up to three meters wide. Now you're more energy than matter, more wave than particle. Mm. And it's this center then that connects you to the unified field. And that frequency that the heart is emitting carries information. And you can lay the thought of your healing onto it because that thought can be carried on that energy. It can't be carried on the energy of suffering. Suffering carries a different thought. It can't be on fear that doesn't, it cannot, your thought of healing cannot be carried on that frequency. Mm. The thought of your new life can't be carried on unless this center is open. Now you're creating more from energy and less from matter. And imagine you're feeling so whole that you're no longer looking for it because you feel like you already have it. Why would you judge somebody who would lose the feeling? And at the same means now you're broadcasting a whole new electromagnetic signature. And whatever we emit, whatever we broadcast into the field is our experiment with destiny. So then it makes sense then that the moment you lose that energy or lose that feeling and you start getting impatient on the freeway or judgmental at work, you just disconnected from the energy of your future and you're back to the energy of your past. Don't expect anything to change. And if you tell me it was that person or that experience that did it to me, <laughs> I'm going to say to you, oh, you're back to the unconscious program, believing that you're a victim, that you're allowing someone out there to control how you feel and how you think. Isn't that a victim? So then when you start changing your thoughts and feelings now, and you're broadcasting a whole new signature, now it makes, it makes perfect sense then that you're a vibrational match between you and your future then if you're creating from the center and you're feeling like you already have it, you no longer have to go and get it and drag your body through space to get it to work or to wherever. You actually start warping space and time and you start drawing the event towards you. Now you're the magnet and the side effect of that is the synchronicities, the serendipities, the opportunities, the coincidences, the magic, the flow that starts to happen. So then when a person reaches that precipice where they're nobody, no one, no thing, nowhere, and no time, and they're beyond themselves, that's not the end. That's the beginning. So then the quantum field then is that realm where there's an infinite amount of time. Now imagine that time was eternal. Mm. Like you had all the time in the world to get anything done. <sighs> what could you get done? You, only equal to your imagination, right? right? So in the realm of time space, in the quantum, when there's an infinite amount of time, that time is eternal, there's one big now, it means then that all possibilities exist in the eternal now because if you had an infinite amount of time, then you can get everything done equal to your imagination and that's the quantum. And But there's nothing physical there that exists in space and time, local. It's non-local, everything's possibility. It's a wave function in quantum physics. It's frequency, it's vibration, it's energy, it's information, it's consciousness. Uh, that realm is the realm of possibilities. And when you're in that realm, 
Your job then as a consciousness is to begin to connect to greater levels of oneness, wholeness, and order. Well, you would say to me, how do I know they exist? Well, if you study string theory, quantum physics, they're making an attempt to unify all the forces that make everything physical appear, right? So then you may say, well, it doesn't exist, and I'll say, well, your nose doesn't exist until you put your attention on it. It's always been there. But if you don't pay attention to it, it doesn't exist. Well, the quantum field is the same way. So then as you start connecting to it, and we've seen this now, and people start hooking in to this frequency, and they know how to change their brainwaves, and now they're slowing their brainwaves down to such a degree that they're starting to move into theta brainwave patterns. Now, this mechanism, this melon, <laughs> this, this seat of the conscious awareness, the seat of your identity, the known self, Lights are out. Lights are out in that center. You are out of the way, and all of a sudden, your conscious mind starts to merge with your subconscious mind, your autonomic nervous system. And when it begins to eclipse, it begins to do exactly what it's supposed to do really well, and that is create order, create, create homeostasis, create balance. And the thing is, though, when this occurs, the frequency in our brain scans when a person hooks up, they've suppressed their, they've gotten beyond their analytical mind, they've suppressed this brain, they're highly suggestible to information, and they learn how to operate in their subconscious mind, not with thinking, but by feeling. When they start tuning into frequencies, and they connect to a frequency, and this is shut off, we see just an excitation of energy in the limbic brain, in the center of your brain that is so intense. Now you talked about normal when you asked the question. Most people, whether you're measuring height, weight, intelligence, eyesight, hearing, if you were to take a huge swipe of the population and measure any one of those things, you would see the same bell curve. Mm -hmm. And that high part of the bell curve is where average is. And you draw a line down the middle and you draw two other lines. And now you have three standard deviations above normal and three standard deviations below normal. So average is that big, biggest surface area. Then as it drops down, that's about 68% of people are average. Then you have about 13%, a little better eyesight, 13% a little worse eyesight. And then when it gets really narrow, 2% amazing eyesight, 2% really bad eyesight. That's 99.7% of the population. Three standard deviations above or below normal. Our scans are showing high gamma brainwave patterns. Gamma, super consciousness, super awareness, 200, 300, 400, 500 standard deviations outside of normal. Now that's supernatural. So that line comes down and it keeps getting narrower and narrower. Draw another 297, 397 lines past that. That's where the person's energy is in the brain. They're having a very transcendental moment and they are connected to a frequency and that frequency is carrying information and now the brain is acting like a transducer like a television antenna that's taking frequency and turning it into meaningful imagery the only thing is the imagery is more real than this more real than anything you've experienced with your senses so then in a matter of seconds they're downloading information from the field and they're upgrading their human operating system it's a side effect of that is a person with serious eczema, serious psoriasis, uh, uh, serious depressions, uh, uh, very serious hormonal imbalances, in one second, hearing problems in one second, gone. Because why? Because their consciousness and the consciousness of the unified field is beginning to merge. And they're putting more of attention on it and less of attention on them. And they start becoming the consciousness of everybody, of everyone, of everything, of everywhere and every time. And as their consciousness gets closer to the consciousness of source, the zero point field, singularity, universal mind, whatever you want to call it, and they've lost themselves in the moment to such a degree, they've gotten so far beyond themselves that that world is the real world. The instant that that happens, there's less separation between two points of consciousness. If there's less separation between two points of consciousness, you have less time, because time is created by the separation of two points of consciousness, which means A, whatever they're creating is gonna happen in a shorter amount of time, because they're that connected, and B, which is 
equally as important is that they feel more whole. They're experiencing such a level of oneness that now they're no longer waiting for their healing to feel wholeness or gratitude. They're not waiting for their new relationship to feel love. They're not waiting for the mystical moment to feel awe. They are having, they're actually so caught up in the moment that they are so in the eternal now. That, and this door between the conscious mind and the subconscious mind is so wide open that whatever they're thinking becomes real. And so now all of a sudden you have profound inner moments. Now think about this. Experience enriches the brain. It's a fact. The end product of an experience is called an emotion. So a person's having an inner event that is more real than any past external event, event any betrayal, any shock, any trauma, any event that caused them to move out of balance 20, 30, 40 years ago that they haven't been able to overcome. The inner event is carrying an amplitude of energy that's greater than the betrayal. The feeling of love, it's not chemical, it's not heavy like those survival emotions. This is electric and it's highly organized, it's highly unifying. They're feeling this unknown new feeling and it's electric and they can't help but pay attention to the pictures in their mind and now they're beginning to remember their future. And in a sense, they're going to come back to their senses and they are going to perceive a broader spectrum of reality because their brain is now wired to perceive what has always existed, but they didn't have the circuits in place to see it. So we don't see things how they are. We see things how we are. And so then the person now, their spectrum of the way reality really is, some, some, some illusion, some veil, some conditioning has been removed and they're less seduced by the outer world. And they'll say, whatever that feeling was is way better than any drug, way better than any shopping spree, spree and way greater than any football game. That there, I want more of that. That's, that was electrifying. And so now, they're turning more of their attention inward where happiness and joy and love has always been. And now when you get to that point where you're so happy with yourself, so in love with yourself, that you don't want to be anybody else but you, I think we've arrived. You no longer need that disease to wake you up. That's right. Well, the disease then, well, what happens is, is that, you know, people when they have diseases, it's so interesting because they can recall the event uh, that, that started their downward spiral in their life. And really, the strong emotion from that event had altered them to such a degree that they were so disoriented or so altered inside of them that they narrowed their focus and froze an image and the brain took a snapshot and that's called a memory. So long-term memories are created by heightened emotional experiences. So then how are you gonna change that? You gotta have an inner event that's greater than the betrayal, greater than the shock. And in a matter of seconds, the brain reorganizes, remolds, and new chemical signals going to the body. And all of a sudden, you could say in a moment, the past is washed away. And in a sense, it is because we've seen the side effects of that in terms of healing and change in uh, people's lives. I feel like you just embodied, I'm going to try to sum it up as quickly as I can because that was so beautiful. But for me, everything that I've learned of interviewing all of these people and making the documentary and speaking to you, it's like healing is really a spiritual event of reconnection and mm -hmm. coherence is what gets you, gets us into homeostasis where our bodies are designed to heal, right? But you can only access that inner healer if you're in a coherent state. Right, right. And out of survival. Out of survival. And feeling safe enough to relax into the present moment, right? So like in our events, the first day is about overcoming yourself and everybody's trying to disentangle from the program, right? And they're doing everything else but following the formula because that's what you do when you're doing, you're gonna do it your way. And then sooner or later, <laughs> you give them numerous, numerous opportunities, they start going, okay. And all of a sudden they start creating coherent brain. Now, coherent brain is what sends the signal out. That's your intent you're putting out into the field. Like, I got a very clear image of what I want and that is the thought going out. The more coherent the brain, the more you're dropping a very clear pebble into the water that's producing perfect concentric rings. You're producing a field that's highly organized. So now the message is very clear into the field. At the same time, you start opening your heart to life again. Yeah, well, 
you may say, well, I can't really do that. I, I don't really feel love. And I'd say, well, how much in your waking day do you practice feeling gratitude or love? Uh, I don't. Well, then you're not going to feel it. So get a person to that infinite space where there's nobody, no one, no thing, nowhere, and no time and say, out of all the infinite possibilities you can put your attention on, let's put it right there. And where you place your attention is where you place your energy. And let's just keep our attention there, moment after moment. And let's breathe. And let's feel. And let's work on cultivating a state and opening your heart. And like a flower, petal by petal, if your attention is there, where you place your attention is where you place your energy. And you start cultivating energy in the heart and it starts to bloom. But it may take a week. So what? How long have you kept it closed to protect yourself from being hurt again? So then when the heart starts getting highly coherent and it's producing those measurable effects, the heart is what the elevated emotion is the magnetic field that draws the event back to you. So if you're living in lack and you come back to your senses and say, where's my sports car? You're back to the old person. And if you're not feeling the feeling, you're not drawing anything back to you. So then if the thought sends the signal out and the feeling draws the event back, then you better be in your heart and know how to maintain that modified state of mind and body your entire day independent of the conditions in your environment, independent of the habits and emotional uh, conditioning of your body, independent of time. And if you do, get ready, because something weird is going to happen in your world. That's the side effect. So now, coherent signal, coherent signal. Now you're broadcasting a very clear radio signal. You're creating very high organization. So then, the more coherent your brain and heart are, the more, it can, more they can read information from the field, electromagnetically, and the more clear the signal is into the field as well. Well, what's the antithesis? Incoherent brain, incoherent heart. You can wish all you want. You could pray all you want. You can beg. You could hope. You know, you can try. You can force. But the incoherence is not creating any signal in the field. In fact, you're feeling separate. You're not there. So then, you're matter trying to change matter, and it's just going to take a long time. Okay. So, so I've, I've worked for over 10 years now in getting people to practice brain and heart coherence. In the beginning, they thought I was crazy, that hate mails about what is this space thing and, you know, I don't get it. I'm just <laughs> going to rush and just do the, the, the creation part. But now you can look at an audience in my, in my event. We just came from Mallorca just uh, less than a week ago. And um, you can look out in the audience of 1,300 people, and nobody is moving. They're sitting there, they're, they're gone. They're, they, they, can, they know how to do it. It's just, they don't know how to do it. And what are they doing? They're having very profound moments that have nothing to do with this three-dimensional reality. So, so then, how does that apply to disease? Well, well, immune system gets stronger, you have all these amazing benefits, telomeres lengthen, the body's in a growth cycle. You're, you're, yeah, the stronger the emotion you feel to the problems and conditions in your life, the more you pay attention to them. And where you place your attention is where you place your energy. So you're giving your power away to that person or that problem. And that's available energy you could be using to design a new destiny. So teaching people to get beyond their problems, get beyond the emotions of those problems. If they're no longer feeling those emotions, they're no longer paying attention to that person or problem. And in a sense, they're taking their power back. Mm. They're building their own electromagnetic field. And that's energy for them to heal with. That's energy for them to design a new destiny. They are literally adding to their own field. And we've measured this. Now, the person is lighter, they're looser, they're freer, they're less rigid. They're tr not trying as hard. Uh, they feel connected to something greater. So. Imagine every experience that you have in your interaction in the field with your awareness. Experience begins to lay down circuits in your brain. So if every ex experience enriches the brain, every experience that you consciously have, if you were to make time to connect to that field, that unified field, and you knew what you were looking for, and I said to you, feel it, experience it, pay attention to it, become more aware of it, Become more aware of it and less aware of you. Feel more of it, feel less of you. If you practice doing that, every experience is going to lay down new circuitry in your brain. And we could say then, 
you're wiring your brain to be connected to the divine, to universal mind, which means then if you did this properly, you just may see the divine in every human being because now your brain is wired for it and you would experience less judgment, less lack, less separation because you, would, you, you couldn't feel that if you were connected to something greater. And what's the benefits? Well, we want to be able to do this with our eyes open as well as our eyes closed because now you have coherent heart, you have a coherent brain, the signal is crisp, and now you can tune in to frequencies and like a radio receiver, latent systems in the brain switch on and you're going to know things and you're not going to know them in linear time. You're going to just know them because you feel connected to something greater. So that's what we're seeing now in the work that we're doing. And so the formula has become the basis. If you're going to have a clear intention and an elevated emotion to create reality, you better have a very coherent brain. You better have a very coherent heart. Otherwise, it's dinner conversation. Otherwise, it's good theory. And if you're not going to do the work to create the brain and heart coherence, you're not going to get a good signal. It's like not having a Wi-Fi signal. You're just, you, ha you, don't have, you don't have it in place. You, know, you can't find the, the signal. Uh, so that, that becomes, we've worked for so many years to get people to this point, and now we're taking the formula and saying, okay, you healed yourself, okay, let's see if you can heal another person. And so we've created opportunities for people to understand that formula of brain and heart coherence that understands the basic science that it's not matter that's emitting a field, it's the field that's creating matter. So if you change the field, you change matter. You see, people wrap their mind around this, and all of a sudden, you start seeing profound instantaneous healings going on right before you. So then what's the next thing? Well, okay, so you healed the person laying before you, you healed yourself. Is it possible then you really need the person there? Well, if the quantum field is about connecting to everything non-locally that's material, you just need a picture. You don't need to be there. And now we have students. We had a person in uh, Mexico City uh, that went to an event in Berlin, Germany last year, was in a group of eight people, seven people, and, and uh, they healed the person there, instantaneous change, and uh, they all went their own ways, and then the woman got back to Mexico City, and her brother went into a coma for two weeks. She called the healing group. She sent the picture out. They sat down. Within an hour, he was out of that coma. What? Immediately, yeah. And so then we just got another one just, uh, just, just today. Just another person who, uh, who a 17-year-old daughter, uh, a woman was, 17-year-old daughter of a woman who was in our event who uh, was in a coma from a car accident. They tried everything. The moment the coherence group showed up, they got together, closed their eyes, saw the picture. The moment they started doing it, she started moving her arms. Within the time, by the time they finished, she was speaking and making an attempt to move her entire body. That's, that's ah. non-local communication, yes. right? And so, what's the value behind that? It's never been about us. It's like the living organism of human beings, mm -hmm. the species of human beings. I mean, what is our future? I mean, we gotta learn how to heal each other. Mm -hmm. We gotta exchange information. We gotta support each other. Uh, we got to communicate better. We have to shine for one another, not so that we outdo others, so that they can shine as well, right? So cooperation, collaboration, this is what it's about. It's about a living organism coming back to consciousness. And what, what, what bonds this living organism is that frequency of love. And we've done the studies to prove that once you start getting into that state, you can influence a person's autonomic nervous system by just holding the thought that their lives should be better that their lives should be enriched, that their bodies should heal, that their dreams should come through. And everybody's heart goes into coherence. At a remote location who's wearing monitors at the exact same time, huh, you can change the world uh, when you begin to look at it this way. So, so we're always doing our best to evolve the formula and saying, okay, we've done this, we've done this, we've done this, and we're getting good at this, so what's the next thing? Let's see if we can go to the next level. And so that's what we're doing. We're just, we're just, we're taking that formula to another level. Each workshop, you're like yeah. excited to see what new level you can achieve. And, and you know, there's always a little doubt until someone does it. Mm -hmm. And then we only need one or two people to do it. And all of a sudden, there goes that four minute mile again. So how does, the, does the field with 1,300 people sitting there, you know, everybody's in a coherent state and broadcasting this strong electromagnetic, 
magnetic field, broadcasting this love um, and elevated emotion, does that strengthen the field which causes more miraculous things to happen or yeah the, the so, group community? yeah so there so there is a very powerful group dynamic that takes place and and we've seen this in earlier research when people are getting beyond themselves not every event but some events the energy of the room actually drops and the scientists that were conducting the studies were they were really worried they came running up and said the energy in the room's dropping the energy and I say I know I know because when you're drawing from the field and breaking your energetic bonds with everybody and everything in your life and taking your power back. You're drawing from the field so the energy of the room drops a little bit and you're building your own field, right? And so then as you start building your own field and you start self-regulating and you're creating heart coherence, here comes your waves and here comes another person's waves and they're maybe a little out of sync but all of a sudden they start unifying, right? They start, they start summating and when that happens the amplitude goes up so the higher the amplitude, the higher the wave, the higher the energy in the room. But it starts to become entrained. And when people are opening their awareness and tuning into energy, you start creating one mind. You start creating one heart. You start creating a collective consciousness. No different than those birds, you know, they're all flying in one direction or the fish all moving as a school. When you study that phenomenon, it's called emergence. You, you would think that it's a top-down phenomenon, that there's some leader that everybody's following. <laughs> But in fact, there is no leader. It's a bottom-up phenomenon. Everybody's leading. So now you have one mind and one heart, and you're synchronized. So what's the, what's the uh, advantage of that? Number one, the appearance of those birds, the appearance of those fish to another fish or to another bird or predator gives the appearance of something larger, right? And they have to be synchronized. If they're out of sync, it doesn't mean anything, right? Mm -hmm. So they have to move as an organism. So now you have this living organism that's emerging and in this particular time it's such an important time for us to be alive because every system every paradigm is collapsing mm -hmm. whether it's the environment whether it's the political model the economic model the religious model the education model journalism the medical model uh, it's all falling apart and because we can't sustain this kind of behavior for an extended period of time, the species won't survive, right? Mm -hmm. So every time there's a growth in information, information then creates a greater level of awareness. Awareness is consciousness, and you can't have consciousness without energy. So we're seeing this dramatic energetic shift that's taking place on the planet because people are so informed. So if you study systems uh, in, in terms of uh, chaos theory, when information is revealed into the system, there's greater awareness, the system unravels because the new information is causing a chaos to unravel uh, as, in, as energy and information, which is just unpredictable order. It's novelty because it's no longer predictable. That, that is what's happening in our world. So then whatever that energy does is going to endorse who you're being. So if you're living in survival, if you're living agitated, judgmental, frustrated, everything will be amplified because of that. <laughs> if you learn how to self-regulate and you learn how to apply that formula, you're going to be able to take that disorderly energy in the discomfort that you're feeling and have a tool and create order or coherence, a greater level of order out of that. So if you're doing that, and I'm doing that, and I'm not saying it's your fault that I'm this way, and nobody's blaming anybody else, but they're saying, hey, I'm going to work on my fear and my anxiety, you work on your anger and frustration, and let's just take care of ourselves here. I guarantee you, if the whole world was doing it at the same time, something else would emerge, right? The emergence of a new consciousness is, is not one being coming to save the world. It's a collective. Mm -hmm. It's one mind, one heart, and, and um, I think I'm more optimistic about that now than I ever have been. And we should never face uh, these particular breakdowns and challenges in our current world with the same consciousness that's created it. You know, we can't get angry, we can't get fearful, we can't get prejudiced, we can't get, um, we can't suffer. We have to see beyond the illusion of that. And we have to learn how to meet it from a greater level of mind, a greater consciousness. And, and something greater will reorganize if uh, the goodness Mm. in human beings uh, prevails. Let's do it. Um, so if you have these mystical, you go to your workshop, you have this week long of these mystical experiences, you're shifting, you become someone else, you tap into the supernatural. Um, is this 
one and done? Um, do you need to say your arthritis goes away, you walk away, you're like grateful? Do you need to continue practicing this yeah. practice to stay at this level? Um, the answer to the question is yes and no. And I'll answer it because, uh, again, I'm, I'm having my own personal discoveries. You know, people come to the work for all kinds of reasons, whether it's a health condition, whether they want to become abundant, whether they want a new relationship or a new job. They all come for those extraneous reasons. But I found out what people really come for is to become more whole. Yeah. That it's not, it's not your wealth, it's not your health, it's not your new relationship, it's not your new job, it's who you become. And the process, because nobody can take that away from you. So then, we see people make millions and millions of dollars. Uh, they generate abundance. And once they generate abundance, the first thing they want to do is give it back. They want to make a difference in the world. So, we've seen people with very serious health conditions really heal from their health condition, but it was never the health condition that really healed. It was them. They healed, and the side effect of that was a very dramatic change in their biology, right? So some people have instantaneous, miraculous moments. And you would say, well, that person just had a moment. But you forgot that they were up for the last two years, never missing a day in their meditations. And they were practicing, practicing. And that moment was the moment to the outsider who's viewing it with the senses. Oh, that person just got lucky. To that person, she never missed a day. <laughs> that, 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 she loves herself enough because she feels worthy enough to receive that she's overcome so much of herself. Every time you overcome yourself, you're more in love with yourself. That's, that's true love. You're breaking through. And I've seen that in our, we see that all the time in our events. So the person who has the instantaneous healing may appear like it was instantaneous, but they've been on a journey. That person who has that moment, the likelihood of that condition coming back, according to our research, is very slim. Very slim. The person who's taken a little bit longer to move through a condition, the person who uh, has the significant blood value changes and scan changes, they're able to endure that change for a longer period of time. Sometimes it never comes back. Other people, they return back to the same environment, they react to the same people, they go to the same places, they have their same habits. And in time, they return back to the old self, right? And they start thinking and feeling in very similar ways. And, and so they go, they go back into a program. Uh, so we don't see a lot of that, but we do see uh, some people actually have some of their symptoms return or some of their health condition return. So that person then gets back on and says, okay, I took care of it once, I should be able to take care of it again. Now, I also am a pragmatist, I'm a very practical person. And in the work that we do, it's not about denying yourself from information. It's in fact being informed. So if you have a condition or a disease, let's measure. And let's go through three months of you doing something or a series of things, emotional balance, chemical balance, physical balance. You have three types of stress, physical, chemical, and emotional. Three types of balance, physical, chemical, and emotional. You get two out of those three in order. The third one starts coming around. So. A person who's doing that work on a regular basis um, and, they're, and they're putting their time in, in doing it, uh, they, they go for three months. If there's a change, keep going. But if there isn't a change, you got to add something, you got to change something, you got to do something differently because it's, n it's not getting you there, right? So, so you have to have that one foot in the quantum world, one foot in the real world, and you got to be able to straddle both worlds because uh, we're human beings. We have physical bodies and we're here to experience life and, and we're on our, own, uh, on our own paths. But you have to, you have to be evidence-based and you have to look. So, so I do think that it's important um, that people do continue doing the work because it keeps them conscious. And by the same means, there are people who have healed and I have sat down to dinner with them and I say to them, hey, why don't you tell your story to the audience, you know, of how you overcame your genetic disorder. And the person who's had a terrible, turbulent past that was a really angry, bitter person looks at me and says, I can't even remember my story. Like, I'm so over that. I'm so, I'm not telling the story of my past. I'm going to tell the story of my future. In fact, people who do this work, they believe in their future more than they believe in their past. You know, people who wake up every morning 
being defined by a vision of the future. They're more in love with their future than they are with their past. They're romancing their future every day instead of romancing their past. And, and the side effect of that is those, is those opportunities that begin to show up. So the people who heal, they have said to me, hey, uh, that was one of the best challenges of my life. I'm ready for the next one, you know. They're not shrinking from life. They're like, I was more alive Brand. than ever before. So they want to they wanna test their skill sets, and, and they're not contracting. So I think, I think a lot of people that heal uh, then go, out, go about the business of doing even more amazing things, whether uh, you know, they create a psychiatric hospital or they, they, they start a foundation. or I mean, there's people that are doing amazing, amazing things. Uh, but, they, but their disease now becomes their greatest teacher. Mm -hmm. They'll tell you it was my greatest teacher. When they don't overcome it, then of course it's their nemesis. But um, people who actually execute, they'll say, I bless my father. I would, have n I would never be the person I am today if I didn't have that experience. So now they're, huh, they're, the, the, their, their own personal transformation causes them to look back at their entire past and say, I don't want to change anything in my past that brought me to this that's the moment the past no longer exists. And I think that the work that we've witnessed in the week-long events and in witnessing people's own personal transformation is helping them get beyond the familiar past and the predictable future. Those are knowns. Mm -hmm. that, that being in the unknown, being in that present moment, and instead of it alerting an alarm system of fear, that, that fear response, to actually learn in that moment that there's a way to make internal changes and you're just going to get better at it. And as you get better at it, that unknown place called the present moment is the perfect place to create from. Think about it. Mm -hmm. You know when someone's uh, present with you in your life because they're paying attention to you. And you know when they're not present with you because they're not paying attention to you. And if where you place your attention is where you place your energy and you practice every day, self-regulating with your eyes closed to create brain and heart coherence and you know how to do that and you can be present with your husband present with your children present with your co-workers present with pain present with whatever <laughs> where you place your attention is where you place your energy and if you're in the present moment you got a lot of energy to execute now and i think that that's a skill that the more you practice it the better you get at it absolutely and it just tapping into that present moment, infinite possibility, feeling that coherence and those elevated emotions, it makes forgiveness a lot easier, which is, you know, one of the main key ingredients to healing, right? Well, imagine, imagine forgiveness, right? Because I think there's a biology to forgiveness. We've measured oxytocin levels in our work, and oxytocin is the love chemical. In fact, when oxytocin is at its height in vertebrates, uh, the, the mother, uh, the female is bonding to the offspring, and as it grooms and touches and licks and, and rubs, and uh, it's a limbic brain function, and the act of bonding starts releasing oxytocin, right? Uh, by the same means, uh, when you're in a honeymoon stage of a relationship and there's a lot of intimacy, uh, oxytocin levels go up and it creates monogamy, it creates a bond, a union, right? So you look at my research and people say to me, my friends are scientists, what, what are you doing at your events because your oxytocin levels are 200 times normal, not just in one or two people, but many people. So the research on oxytocin says that the smallest increase in oxytocin runs right to the survival center of the brain, the amygdala, and it shuts the lights out for fear and anxiety. It lowers the volume for aggression and uh, anger, and it cools off the circuits for pain and suffering. And there's only one other set of circuits left, joy and love. Ooh. So the person is starting to feel a genuine sense of love. Now, if oxytocin is elevated, oxytocin signals a chemical called nitric oxide. Nitric oxide signals a chemical called endothelial derived relaxing factor. That's just a big word <laughs> that causes a relaxation in your arteries, in your heart, in your lungs. So just like when your sexual organs get aroused and there's blood flow in there and there's activity, imagine the same intensity in your heart. Mm 
Hmm. Now the person's heart, literally, physiologically, is going to swell. They're going to feel full. They're going to feel energy in their heart. That's exactly what switches the heart on, and that's a different consciousness, right? So imagine when that occurs, oxytocin levels go up like that. Imagine feeling so in love with everyone, so in love with life, that the research shows on oxytocin that it's impossible to hold a grudge when you're in that state. In other words, you say, I feel so amazing, I don't wanna lose this feeling. Hey, I take my attention off you. Mm -hmm. But if you're feeling the emotion from the event, the emotion is gonna cause you to keep your attention on that person. So forgiveness, in a sense, is overcoming yourself, overcoming the emotion, and taking your attention off that person. And you free yourself, and you free them. And it, I mean, who is worth giving your life force to? No. Nobody, right? Especially so, them. Right, especially <laughs> them, right. So, so, so it's not like you have to try in this state to be forgiving. Mm. It's really the side effect of a shift in consciousness. Yeah. And, and you would never judge them because I think after a few times of judging them, you'd go, oh, I lost the feeling, right? And so then you'd go, I gotta get it back and I'm not gonna do that again, right? So that's the beginning of unconditional love. I mean, when you feel so happy with yourself, you allow people to be however they wanna be and the side effect of that is you're joyful. You only lose joy when you're judgmental or frustrated with everything around you. So, so that, that, that is the, the natural state of being when we're not in survival. And I say that you can teach people how to do that and do it so well that when that system switches on, huh, 1,300 to 1,400 different chemicals are released in the body that begin to regenerate and repair the body. You're gonna get the body's natural flu shot. Your immunoglobulin levels are gonna go up dramatically. Your telomeres are gonna lengthen. There's growth going on. There's time for regeneration. Uh, 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 genes are gonna be upregulated. Uh, genes make proteins. Proteins give you the structure and function of your body. The expression of proteins is the expression of life. The body moves back into homeostasis and you get a reboot. And that reboot has nothing to do with a drug. It has nothing to do with anything outside of you. It's actually coming from within you. And I think that uh, right now in history, when people understand what they're doing and why they're doing it, the how gets easier. And, and I think that's important for people. What is your one takeaway message on healing? There cannot be a healing uh, in matter, in our bodies, unless we have a healing in our minds, in our hearts. I think uh, that is where the true healing begins. And, and um, I think that I'm beginning to understand that, and I would never say this uh, even two years ago, uh, that we have to be able to execute uh, from energy and from the field. Uh, and when we change the field, uh, it's not our job to change matter. <laughs> That's the side effect, you know, and so, I've seen really profound and wonderful healings, and, and when you interview those people, they'll always say the same thing. It wasn't me. I swear to you, it wasn't me that did this. Some greater power that lives within me and lives within you did it, and I just got out of the way for something greater to happen. So I think we have to lay down the very thing we used our whole life to get what we want for something greater to occur, and that just takes a little practice uh, and uh, developing of a skill.